Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much for this time. Thank you for bringing us here once again to look at the face of Jesus Christ. What a glorious experience it was for John the Beloved when he saw Christ. Christ exalted. Christ glorified. Christ the reigning king. Christ the head of the church. Christ the prince of peace. Christ the master of angels. Christ the unique beloved son of the heavenly father. Lord today as we come to this study of the word we pray that you reveal Christ to every one of us in Jesus name and nobody ever saw you in reality O oh Lord and remained the same therefore Lord we're praying that as you reveal Christ to us this very day will never be the same again in Jesus name the beauty the glory the splendor the majesty of the lord jesus christ his dominion his power his knowledge love that cannot be surpassed lord reveal to us this very time in jesus name that lord as john the beloved on the isle of patmos saw you and it had effect unforgettable effect on him as we come today to see you lord may this vision of christ have unforgettable impact and influence upon every life of everyone hearing in jesus name thank you lord for the answer reveal yourself in jesus name we pray and everybody said a good amen. amen it was still in revelation chapter one and in revelation chapter one i've been going through a series and the first message was the revelation of christ's future glory the second one christ's grace glory and dominion and the third one the certainty of christ's second coming and now the message the vision of the glorified christ if you are listening to this message maybe some weeks or months after this or even some years after this and this is the only cassette you are hearing i want to encourage you that all these messages are tied together and if you want to get the real impact and the full thing that we've done here talking about this glorified christ building a glorious church you need to get the whole series please uh, by the cases will do you good we're in revelation chapter one and revelation chapter one i'm now in verse nine all through to verse 20 the vision of the glorified christ i john who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patience of jesus christ which was in the isle island of island that is called patmos for the word of god for the testimony of jesus christ i was in the spirit on the lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying i am alpha and omega the first and the last and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in asia unto ephesus and unto smana and unto pagamos and unto tatira and unto sardis and unto philadelphia and unto laodicea and i turned to see the voice that speak with me and being turned i saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man clothed in a garment down to his foot and girt about the paths with a golden girdle 
He said, and his ears were white as wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass. As if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as a sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hand, his right hand, upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Right. The things which thou seest, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels the leaders the ministers of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches and that's what we're looking at today. Before the revelation of the events, John was granted the vision of the glorified Christ. And John, you know, he had seen Jesus in the days of his flesh. And now he was allowed to see him in his glorified form. The vision of Jesus which John saw was not a vision of how Jesus will be in the future when he comes to establish the millennial reign. It was a vision of how Jesus is at the present time. And John introduces himself. He almost could not believe because here he was. He was suffering persecution. And the believers of that time, they suffered persecution. Because Domitian, who was reigning at that time, counted Christians as criminals. As if they were enemies of the nation. Because their ways were different from the ways of the world. And they will not bow to any other king. They say, Jesus is Lord. They saw those Christians as rebels. They saw those believers as people that are uncompromising and they will not cooperate with the laws of the land actually those christians were law abiding but the only thing is that whenever the laws of men conflicted with the laws of god they were on the lord's side and the stage on that lord's side obeying submitting to the lordship of christ and they were loyal to the watch of the lord so those unbelieving leaders that did not understand the principle behind their action, they counted them as criminals and as rebels. And so they were persecuting them. But then all the other apostles had died except this John. And he knew the Lord as a young man. And by this time now, he was about age, between 80 and 90. And this man, as old as he was, he refused to retire. And he was still encouraging the believers to stand in the persecution. This John, as a leader, the last surviving apostle. He was encouraging them. And then the mission and his people, they knew that this fellow, although he is old, instead of retiring and getting ready to just pass off, he was still encouraging these people. But then they counted him as the 
greatest of the criminals. And they had done a lot of things to him, and the man, you know, just kept on going. So they said, all right, we'll banish him to the Isle of Patmos, to an island, all alone by himself. And we're told that those days, when they did something like that, there were two kinds of people they banished like that. Number one, the political uh, kind of um, guilty people. It was just political. Others, criminals. But they didn't classify John as a person that was wrong and did something wrong in the political sense. They counted him as the worst of criminals. And they had punished him. They punished him this way. He didn't change. They punished him this way. He didn't change. And they put him in a pot of boiling oil. And the man did not die. And the man was not hurt. And the man did not change. <laughs> They said, this kind of man, how, what do you do with this man? Tell me, what can the devil do with a man? What can Domitian do with a man? What can Nero do with a man? That says, Jesus is my Lord. And do whatever. And act however, Jesus is my Lord. What are we going to do with this man? That's why they banished him. And it's not just ordinary banishment to hard labor. And John submitted to that, and he was there in the Isle of Patmos. And there are three divisions to the message. Number one, the persecution of Christians before the vision. The persecution of Christians before the vision. Number two, the portrait of Christ in the vision. The portrait, the picture, the appearance of Christ in the vision. And then, number three, the purpose of commission after the vision. Come back to number one. The persecution of Christians before the vision. In Revelation chapter one. I'm reading from verse nine. I, John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of jesus christ was in the isle in the island that is called patmos for the watch of god and for the testimony of jesus christ i was in the spirit on the lord's day and i had behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pagamos, and unto Tyra, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. The persecution of Christians before the vision. John mentioned three things about himself and about his fellow Christians. Number one, he said, I am your brother and companion in tribulation. Number two, he said, I am your companion in the kingdom. In the kingdom. After he said, Yes, in the tribulation, but the tribulation has not taken us away from the kingdom. If the tribulation has done anything, it's that it has deepened our roots in the kingdom. If the persecution, if the suffering has done anything at all, it has given us a greater appreciation of the kingdom. Number three, I am your brother and companion in the patience, perseverance of Christ. In the patience and the perseverance of Christ if the persecution if the suffering has done anything at all it has erased it has taken away it has obliterated it has totally erased the impatience we used to have you understand what John is saying the patience of Jesus of Jesus Christ 
how Jesus was born in a manger. And he knew he was going to reign as a king. And he was patient. He was waiting patiently. How Jesus Christ did not even go to the temple to show himself as anybody until the age of 12. And he was waiting patiently. And then after the 12 years, he became 30 years of age before he ever appeared in Jordan. Before John the Baptist to be baptized in water and for people to hear from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, patience. And then for Jesus Christ to carry the cross and go and die for the salvation of the world. And yet Pilate was asking, are you a king then? So do you say for this purpose was I born? He was to be a king. Where is the king of the Jews? And yet he was not reigning as king yet. Patience. And John said, if this persecution, tribulation has done anything for us at all, it has taught us the patience of Jesus Christ. And then he said, don't you know I'm now at the Isle of Patmos? I was in the Isle of Patmos. The very fact that he said he was in the Isle of Patmos means he didn't die there. He came back. And by the time he was now writing to them, sending this to them, he had, they are taking him from that place because they saw that the persecution, the tribulation was actually even getting him deeper into his roots in Christ. And then he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. He said, inside that persecution when the lord's day came i knew the lord's day sunday the first day of the week i was in the spirit yes persecution is there but i was still in the spirit you see persecution does not take away spiritual growth it does not hinder your being in the spirit serving the lord how encouraging it is to learn that persecution or physical suffering does not hinder god's revelation the persecution and earthly trouble does do not necessarily hinder spiritual fellowship and spiritual growth don't you remember moses he wrote the pentateuch genesis to deuteronomy in the wilderness while he was enduring the heavy burden of leading the children of Israel. Oh yes, the problems were there. There were even times they wanted to stone him. That didn't hinder him from getting the revelation that he now recorded Genesis to Deuteronomy. How about David? He was still inspired to write many psalms while he was being persecuted and chased around by Saul. How about Isaiah? He still received the prophecies concerning Christ amid trouble and persecution. Do you remember Ezekiel? How the Lord showed him the visions you have in the book of Ezekiel while he was in exile. How about Jeremiah? He wrote that book when he was under serious trial and deprivation that became almost unbearable. Yet the revelation of the Lord and the prophecies were still given to him. How about Peter? Peter wrote those epistles just before he died and he was crucified. How about Paul? Paul received the revelations and the mysteries of the kingdom that is, that is written in the epistles of Paul while he was suffering persecution and loneliness in his imprisonment. The point the Lord is telling us is persecution does not end the revelation. Persecution does not hinder seeing the vision of the glorified Christ. And you know, some people say, you know, the church in my locality is suffering persecution. And the persecution is so much that, you know, we cannot be in the spirit anymore. We cannot be spiritual anymore. Pray for us. Because if this persecution continues, we will never be able to have spiritual growth. No, no, no. In the midst of that persecution, 
in the midst of all the suffering that the people of the world can heap upon you. You can be in the spirit on the Lord's day. John's banishment in the Isle of Patmos was because of his loyalty to the word of God on the one hand, his faithfulness to the testimony of Jesus Christ. He took the totality of the word of God. And he had been the one that laid his head on the bosom of Jesus Christ. And he knew Jesus. And there was no place Jesus went that John was not there. When Jesus was to go to any special place, there were three disciples in the inner circle. Peter, James, John. And Peter had died. And James had died. And the only one remaining in the inner circle was this John. And he said, I saw a lot when I was with Jesus here on earth. And he kept on giving testimony to the written word of God as well as the testimony of what he had known about Jesus Christ. And that's why he suffered the persecution. But he continued. You will continue. I said you will continue. Uh, we don't count persecution as any strange thing. Uh, the Lord is very faithful. He has assured us that while we remain in this world, we're going to suffer persecution. In John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Reading verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, persecution, suffering, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. I'm reading verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must not may not that we may we must through much tribulation persecution enter into the kingdom of god it's there it's there the persecution and if you have not been persecuted maybe it's because you are not light you're not shining. Maybe it's because you don't have any salt to your testimony. Maybe it's because you are compromising. Maybe it's because you're using worldly wisdom in the practice of your faith. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Reading there in verse 12, it says, Yes, yea. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? Shall suffer persecution. Shall suffer persecution. All that will live godly. It is no strange thing, therefore, that a child of God suffers persecution. Actually, the people that know the Lord, the people that are children of God, the people that disregard the world and then they have their allegiance loyalty unto the king of kings and the lord of lords unto jesus christ the world will not understand them and the religious nominal christians going to all the churches saying hallelujah praise the lord while they are smoking while they are drinking while they are committing immorality they will not understand them that's why it says yes surely certainly all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution i pray you will you will live godly you will live righteously and when you live righteously it has a consequence and this is part of the consequence we're looking at second timothy chapter 2 reading there in verse 9 it says wherein i suffer trouble as an evil doer even 
unto bonds. But the watch of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's a faithful saying. For if we, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him. Because of persecution. Because of trouble. Because of trial. Because of suffering. Because the husband will not give you an easy time at home. When you keep to the word of God. Because your wife will not give you an easy time at home when you keep to the word. Because religious people, churchgoers, will not give you an easy time when you keep to the word. Because uh, there's a little pain, there's a little inconvenience, there's a little suffering when you keep to the word of God. If because of that, you deny him. It says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abided faithful he cannot deny himself i pray you will not deny the lord i said you will not deny the lord and let's come back to revelation now revelation i'm reading from chapter 1 revelation 1 19 right the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be here rafter. And even though he was going through everything he was going through, he still did not allow the pain and the hardship to hinder the God ordained ministry. However hard life may be, no matter what a man may be passing through, he can still be in the spirit. He can still be faithful. He can still declare the message of Christ. And he can still reveal the glory of the Lord to the people around him. And I pray for you that God will reveal his glory through you in Jesus' name. Now, we come to the second part of the message. The portrait of Christ in the vision. I want you to notice here from Revelation chapter 1, from verse 12, see Christ in his glorified form. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one, like unto the Son of Man, closed with a garment down to the foot and girt about with paps the paps with a golden girdle he said and his ears were white as wool as white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto brass fine brass and as if they burnt in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp to a jet sword, and his countenance as the sun shineth in his strength. And that's the description. Of Christ that John saw the portrait of Christ in the vision in this portrait there are nine elements look at them number one the Sun s o n the Sun in the midst of the seven candlesticks number two the Sun s o n in priestly princely prophet's clothes number three 
snowy head and air symbols of the supreme wisdom of christ snowy head snow snowy snowy head and hair symbols of the supreme wisdom of christ number four searching eyes piercing penetrating probing every conscience number five smashing feet to judge the condemned smashing feet to judge the condemned number six sound of the voice of the mighty conqueror the sound of the voice like a mighty thunder sound of the voice of the mighty conqueror number seven seven stars in his sovereign control the seven stars under his sovereign control number eight sharp sword that cuts and condemns number nine shining sun s-u-n shining sun of his convicting countenance as you look at the portrait of christ you see these things one by one it tells us in verse 12 and i turn to see the voice that spake with me and being turned i saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man stop there the sun in the midst of the seven candlesticks and already it tells us what the candlesticks are if you look at verse 20 the mystery of the seven stars without sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks uh, the seven stars are the angels the leaders the minister of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches and so what verse 13 is telling us there is that the son of god the son of man as he promised before he went away i will never leave you i will never forsake you the son of god was in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks in the midst of the church remember now that seven means completeness seven symbolizes fullness and that jesus christ the son of god according to his promise he was in the midst of those seven churches of the whole church in matthew chapter 28 verse 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even to the end of the world he will never leave the church he's in the midst of the church the sun in the midst of the seven candlesticks number two the sun in priestly princely prophets clothes it's in revelation chapter 1 verse 13 and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man closed look at the clothing now closed with a garment down to the foot and got about the palms the waist with a golden girdle this is the son of god in his priestly princely prophet's garment his garment and girdle they show him as the priest they reveal him as the prophet they reveal him as the king wearing the robe worn by the high priest in the old testament that's what we see here the glorified lord in the midst of his church what's he doing closed like that interceding for the church empowering the church supernaturally strengthening the church so that as the ministers are faithful to the lord he our high priest he our great prophet he our lord and king he will be officiating so that the church 
those candlesticks will be faithfully bearing light, the light of Christ in a dark world. Number three, the snowy head and hair. Symbols of the supreme wisdom of Christ. Revelation chapter 1 verse 14. And his head and his hairs were white like wool. As white as snow. White like wool. As white as snow. What does that mean? In Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the air of his head like pure wool, and his throne was like fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Colossians chapter 2 reading from verse 3 colossians chapter 2 verse 3 in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that's christ his snowy white head and air symbolize the purity of his truth and a perfection of his wisdom. And he is in the midst of the church. Purging, purifying. So that he can make us blameless and holy. And so that we'll be able to declare his pure, unadulterated truth. White. And making people whiter than snow. Now, another thing. We read in that verse, uh, in that verse 14. The latter part of verse 14 and his eyes were as a flame of fire his eyes as a flame of fire searching eyes piercing penetrating probing every conscience hebrew chapter 4 verse 13 neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's Christ. That's the Lord. It's knowledge. There's nothing to be compared with that. It's searching eyes. It's penetrating eyes. They see the depths of the heart of everyone in his church. And he looks with holy intelligence. He sees everything in the heart of everyone in the church. He sees accurately. And there are no secrets. There is nothing that misses his piercing, penetrating eyes. And that, that's our Lord. And that's the head of the church. Number five. Smashing feet, smashing feet to judge the condemned. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace. Talking about his feet now, and the reason he's talking about this is because he is the final judge. Because the Father has committed all judgment into his hand. Coming to the Old Testament in Psalm 110. 110. Reading in verses 1 and 2. The Lord said unto my Lord. The Lord, you see how it is written there, capital. That's the Heavenly Father. That's God Almighty. Said unto my Lord. Can you see that Lord? Still a capital L. But you see how the rest is written. The Father saying to the Son. Almighty God saying to his only begotten Son. The Lord said unto my Lord. Sit thou at my right hand. Until I make thine enemies thy food too. You will tread on them. You will march on them. You will smash them. 
smashing feet to judge the condemned. The Lord shall send it the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. That, that's what you'll do. He will judge. And this Christ we're talking about with the feet like white, hot, glowing brass. That's a symbol of judgment on sin and sinners. He cannot, he will not condone sin in his church. He will smash and crush the righteous who remain in sin until they die. And they remain sinners for all eternity. He will smash and crush them. Number six is the sound of the voice of the mighty conqueror. Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace. And his voice, and his voice, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Back up to verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Sound of the voice of the mighty conqueror. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 30 and 31. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth for the lord has a controversy of the nations he will plead with the nations he will plead with all flesh he will give them that are wicked to the sword says the lord and that's talking about jesus christ when he comes and then he sounds with his mighty voice in ezekiel chapter 43 reading there in verse 2 and behold the glory of the god of israel came from the way of the east and his voice was like a noise of many waters and the earth shined with his glory psalm 29 I'm reading to you there from verse 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord, mighty and powerful, full of majesty. His sounding voice shows his majesty, shows his power, and it shows his authority. It speaks authoritatively in his church and he speaks authoritatively to the church and he speaks to the world authoritatively through the church when christ speaks in his church in his church christ the savior the lord he speaks with authority when he speaks in the church when he speaks to the church he speaks with authority when he uses the world the church to speak to the world christ speaks to the world with authority when he speaks through the church and then we come back to revelation in revelation chapter one we're not looking at the seven stars under his sovereign control in Chapter 1 of Revelation verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. He had in his right hand seven stars. Stars 
What does that mean? Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. They are the leaders, they are the pastors of the churches. A, a pastor is supposed to be like a star. A, a pastor is supposed to be shining, shining with the light of the star. A pastor is supposed to be high above in character, in behavior, in action. In everything he does, that the Lord looks at him like a star. And then he says, all those stars are in his right hand. They are under his control, his sovereign control. Hey, look at Daniel chapter 12, reading from verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness. Who are those people? That turn many to righteousness. I know we quote this when we are, you know, doing soul winning and, you know, talking about soul winning. I know we do that. But how many people do those soul winners turn to the Lord? Don't you remember? When the prophecy came on John the Baptist, that the spirit and the power of Elijah shall be upon him and he shall turn many to the understanding of the almighty that turn many to righteousness those are leaders of churches it says they'll shine as stars forever and ever and so these stars the seven stars in his hand they are the pastors they are the leaders christian leaders and they are under a sovereign control. Come back to Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Out of his mouth went a two sharp two-edged sword. You know what that sword is? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts. That's the sword coming out of his mouth. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. Revelation 2, verse 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth that is the people that do not repent that what will that sword will cut and that sword will condemn a sharp sword that cuts and condemns now number nine a shining sun of his convicting countenance revelation chapter 1 verse 16 in the latter part of verse 16 and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus the Lord. He shines in his church. And he shines through his church. He reflects his glory through the church. And we who love him must reflect and reveal his glory to the watching world. You see, this is what John saw when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. What was his reaction? 
What was his response to what he saw? We come to Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and of hell and death. Here Jesus Christ, he lifted him up. He said, when I saw him, I knew him before. In the days of his incarnation and humiliation. I saw him before. Gentle, meek, and lowly. I saw him before. We walked together in the streets of Jerusalem and Judea. We went together. And we, I, I was always very close to him. And I leaned on him. When I saw him this time, it's different. It's different. The one, John, who leaned on Christ's bosom in the days of his humiliation when he saw him and he saw his glory his majesty his dominion and he saw this christ the way he was after the suffering now in the glorification and exaltation he fell down with fear if a loyal faithful believer became so fearful when he saw the glorified christ tell me how will the sinner be? How will the sinner react when he sees Christ on the judgment seat? Here, Christ was not coming to judge John. He wanted to reveal something to him. And he knew this is Christ. And he knew it's Christ because in verse 1 he said, The revelation of Jesus Christ. He knew it was Christ, but unbelievable incredible when he saw jesus christ he just fell down sinners who reject the savior now when they see christ on that final day how they will tremble with fear and fright when they stand before the judge of the whole earth and they look at jesus in the fury of the final judgment but john don't be afraid fear not and the Lord brought assurance to John with a touch of love and comfort. He was not to be afraid. He was to receive a new commission from Christ. Christ who is the first and the last. Christ the one who is alive forevermore. Christ the one who has the keys of hell and of death. These titles of Christ, as Christ announced to John on the Isle of Patmos, it brought reassurance and comfort to fearful John. Not only that, it also brought reassurance that, aha, uh -huh, Nero is not the final judge. Yes, Domitian, our persecutors, they do not have the final say. Yes, the key of the universe is not in the hand of our persecutors i see my christ again i saw him when he took him i saw him when those people came and then peter drew out the sword and he cut off the ear of one of their servants and jesus said let it be how will the scriptures be fulfilled this is the time of my humiliation put back your sword and then John stood back and watched his Lord as they took him and they crucified him. And he saw how they crucified him hanging on the tree. And Jesus, when he was there and the form of his visage was changed and it, it was like looking at him, the beauty had gone. The suffering was too much. And Jesus when he suffered like that, John could not bear to even look at that. But eventually he rose again and he went to heaven. This humiliated Christ, how we see now, we know he gave us the truth. We know he is the way. We know he saved us. How we see now, 
and then Christ appeared. And as John saw Christ, and he realized that history and the universe, that the key of everything that was, that is, that will ever be, the key is in the hand of this Christ. What a new commitment it brought to him. And a new reassurance it gave him. And then Christ said, John, all that you've gone through in the pot of boiling oil, and as old as you are now, and you are thinking, maybe I came to take you home. I didn't come to take you home. I came to give you a new commission. At 80, at 90, John, you cannot retire. I have a message to all the churches. Pick up your pen. Begin to write. He that has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says unto the churches. And at this age, 80 or 90, John began a new phase of ministry. You'll begin a new phase of ministry. The more you see Christ and the glory of Christ, and the glory of Christ becomes revealed to you again, the more it will commission you to a new thing that you ought to do. Everyone who sees the vision of Christ also receives commission to reveal him to others. A true God-given vision, a true God-given revelation leads to duty, leads to responsibility. Write it, John. The vision you see, the revelation you see is not for nothing. And thus it was with John and with every other person that saw the revelation. Receive the message. Be renewed by the message and then reveal the message to others. I told you that everyone that has any revelation of the Lord, a clear revelation, vision of the Lord, will also have, will always have a new commission. Because in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his throne filled his train, filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried one to another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean leaves. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He saw a new vision. Isaiah. He says, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, lo, this has touched thy lips. And thy iniquities are taken away, is taken away. And thy sin is purged. After seeing that vision, what follows? After revelation, responsibility. When you see a new vision of the Lord, of the glory of the Lord, there will be a new mission. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, everybody, here am I. Send me. Rise up and let us pray. Here am I. Here am I. Here am I. Send me. Have you got a new revelation of Christ? Do you see now who Christ is in his glorified form?
you need to talk to the Lord in prayer seeing the revelation of Christ brings added responsibility to your life send me Lord send me Lord 